thrilled to have as our Tuesdays with, not Lori, but Tuesdays with Bud. <laughs> <laughs> not quite as thrilling a title or name, but still a wonderful speaker and a wonderful person. We're thrilled. And uh, we're glad to have Bud, who is a historian, as all of you know, and director emeritus of the McClellanville Village Museum. And we're going to push this today, because if you've not been there, you have missed something. It's an excellent museum. He has been described, oh, I should mention, he was born in McClellanville. Did I get that right, Bud? Yes, sir. And moved, but moved to North Charleston. My daddy decided we should go closer to where he was employed, and he made me go. <laughs> How old were you? I was uh, four. So it's really a really <laughs> I love my daddy, but I don't like that. <laughs> he's been described, and this came from, I love this article, where he's described as South Carolina's most accidental historian and preservationist. <laughs> I just had some t a time to kill after I retired, so he founded the Village Museum. Isn't that nice? <laughs> and actually, I, I didn't retire, I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> Three times. I, two, how many times? Three times. <laughs> just do a bio of Bud today. <laughs> um, during his second career, which he describes as his best project by far, he has taught himself and created a new institution that has preserved McClellanville's history and continues to teach many others. And if you do stop by, you will in fact learn much about McClellanville and the whole region. It's just a wonderful experience. The museum has drawn praise from many, and those who have want, gone there, obviously, but also some professionals like Faf Ruffins, a curator from the Smithsonian's New Museum of African American History and Culture, who said, I have toured many, many museums throughout the nation and other places around the world. While most small museums are run with a boundless enthusiasm, it's quite rare to find such high standards of care, such a detailed and complex understanding of different parts of a local community's history and such a gracious and cordial host. And if you go, you know that. I love this uh, quote Bud said, we're not just a facility that tells a story and artifacts and displays, we're more, more than anything we're educated. We teach people history. And that's what Bud is here today to do, to tell us about the people of the history of the St. James, St. T. Parish, and the Clellanville. Join me in welcoming Bud. As most of you who know me know, nothing he said is true. <laughs> uh, except for one thing, the Village Museum is the very best thing that I've ever done in my life. Uh, I'm proud of a lot of things, but the museum fills me with pride every time I'm there. Uh, I've had an amazing bunch of volunteers over the years. People give me credit for starting the museum. I had an idea, but everybody in McClellan Mills had a hand in that museum. Old, young, I had old people cleaning windows. Just talked to one of his relatives here. He was a man certified blind, but he cleaned every window in that museum until it squeaked. That's when he knew it was clean. Uh, I had people, old people up on the roof, putting a new roof on it, and building exhibits in the garage, stealing things from people's places of business. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who that was, because they'll come get me. But we put together a museum that we're very proud of. The letter you quoted is one of the proudest moments in my life, and I got that in from the Smithsonian saying that we were really one of the finest museums she's ever seen. That made me feel pretty special, still does. But I'm not here to talk about the museum today. I'm here to talk about McClellanville and St. James Santee Parish. And then I'm going to get y'all all back to the homes, you get you on the bus, and you're going back to the homes. <laughs> I've never seen so many people to come hear me talk before. This is scary, y'all. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but I want to tell you one quick story. Years and years ago, when we had first started the museum, I was invited to go to Andrews to speak in the morning. That time, I was living in North Charleston. 
Now, Andrews and North Charleston ain't the next door neighbors. And these people were the Rotarians, and they invited me to speak about the village. And they invited me to speak at 7 o'clock in the morning in Andrews. <laughs> now, you've got to get up before daybreak to get there. And I made it, and I was on time. And they were about ready to introduce me and said, man, can you just wait a little bit? One of the fellows is not here. He always comes. I know he's going to be here. And he's the town historian. We want him here. I said, okay. So 10 minutes went by, 15 minutes went by. And finally, 20 minutes later, this old man came walking in. I will say an old man because I'm an old man now. I know he was old because I was young then. But anyway old man came in and he sat down and he kind of gave me a nod like go ahead and talk and I started and it wasn't five minutes later that old man went <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and the longer I looked at him I said this is going to be the shortest talk they ever heard in their life <laughs> but you know what I'm older and I might be a little wiser so today Y'all are so lucky. I'm going to talk until the last one of you nod off. <laughs> so just hunker down. It's going to be a while. We in McClellanville have a rich and long history. We in McClellanville, long before we became a village, were St. James Santee Parish. And St. James Santee Parish is the second oldest parish in the state of South Carolina. <clears throat> Only those snooty people in Charleston are older than we are. <laughs> and we've got some snooty ones in the village, but I won't name them. <laughs> and they're very proud that we're that old. And I am too. But the first folks to live in McClellanville weren't French, English, Scott Irish, and not a soul from Charleston lived there. There were the Siwi Indians called at home. And if you go right in the middle of downtown McClellanville along our creek, that's where one of their villages was. And if you go and grope around in the mud down by the shrimp boats down there in this particular location, you still find Native American artifacts, mainly pottery. But uh, that was where King Jeremy lived. And our creek, Jeremy Creek, is actually named after the king of the Siwi Indians. He took on an English name, Jeremy. I don't think too many Indians had that name. And a title, king, because they were dealing with the representatives of the king of England, the boat captains that they were working out their trade arrangements with. And they said, well, if he's a king, I must be a king. I'm the head of my people. And so along the South Carolina coast, there were several kings. All of them heads of their tribes. And our man was a, a pretty good fellow. He did, like most politicians, leaders, take care of himself first. He had a nice plantation on the Santee. It's called Indian Field still today. And that was his place. Now, the rest of the land he kind of gave off to everybody else, but he kept his. Also, the other thing that the Siwi Indians are known for is that they were pretty easy going and they got along with most people that came to this country. Uh, John Lawson, an Englishman, was hired to leave Charleston and travel up the coast, up the Santee, on into the uh, wilderness and write about what he saw along the way, human habitation, animals, bugs everything, rivers, creeks, he wrote all about it. And his story is still being told and published today. And as he traveled, he would take on a, lead, uh, a person from each tribe to, to lead him through their area. And a Siwi Indian took him two hours. The first place he stopped off was at Bulls Island. And he wrote just what everybody else that's ever been to Bulls Island writes. The bugs are horrible here. <laughs> and he didn't stay long. And they moved on and went up the river. But on the way, this fella told him the story of their tribe. And this story survives today. 
If you go to the Seaweed Restaurant in Allendale, they tell you about the Seaweed Indians in their area. And the story goes that they kept dealing with these ship's captains on such a regular basis and getting shafted. You know, they were giving them little trinkets and they were giving the other way around wonderful deer hides and furs of all types. They were very valuable and wanted in England. And so the first commerce in this part of the world was basically in fur trade and trading with the Indians themselves. And they didn't give the Indians such a good, good break on them. And uh, so they decided we're not going to deal with these fellows anymore. We'll go deal with the king himself. Now the legend says they went into the woods and got more furs than normal, more hides, and they, dealt, they went into the woods and cut down some large cedar trees and built more dugouts than normal. And they paddled away for England. And they didn't realize how far England was. They saw these little ships coming on a regular basis and they said, it can't be that far away. Well, it was. And a storm came up and capsized their little dugouts and those that didn't drown were picked up by slave ships and taken into slavery. The rest were gone. At the time this story was written, 57 of the tribe were left. Now, I like that story, but it might be more legend to it than truth because the Seawee Indians went to war with the Yamasee some years later and were wiped out by the English of Charleston. The little tribes all up and down South Carolina coast, the Wandos and the Cusabos and all these other little tiny tribes, Westos, uh, Etowans, they all were wiped out because they joined a confederation along with the Yamasees. The Yamasees went to war, everybody went to war, and the English had a wonderful opportunity to get rid of some problems, and they did. Uh, so we don't have any more seaweed Indians in the neighborhood. I always tell people when they village, visit the village museum, I say, one day there's going to be a knock on that door and some young man or some young lady's going to be standing there and say, I'm the last seaweed Indian alive. I want my land back and I'm going to open up a casino. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know what I'm going to say? I want to be your partner. <laughs> We're going to make a killing. <clears throat> but that's basically all that's known about the Seaweed Indians except for one thing. They did treat the people here fairly well. But they didn't treat each other too well. The Seaweed Indians were big slavers. If you fight another tribe and win, what do you do with the young man that wanted to kill you two minutes ago? They had a solution. Sell him off into slavery into the sugar plantations down in the Caribbean. They dealt in trading with people. And uh, we came along later and did the same thing. But um, they were pretty experienced at it. So they were brutal to one another, but real kind to us. <coughs> The first Europeans to come and settle in our area, as you might know, you might all have studied, were the Huguenots, the French. They came and settled up on the Santee River where the little, little community of Jamestown is located today. Jamestown's not, I hate to say that because I know somebody from Jamestown, it's not much today. It's a little intersection, they just got a Dollar General to be proud of. Um, they, so they don't have to travel to McClellanville to shop anymore. But <laughs> back then there was nothing there but the Santee River and wilderness. The French came and settled to settle in Charleston. Two boatloads of them came. They landed successfully. They went in. These were shopkeepers and artisans. And when you set up a colony, the very first people you send in are shopkeepers and artisans, tanners, uh, blacksmiths, 
carpenters. They come in so they can establish a community. Well, the English had already sent their men in to do that and their families to do that. And here comes two boatloads of the same kinds of people. Well, the English got together and they voted, we don't need them. They call them those French. What do we do with those French? Well, you know what they did with those French? They voted to push them out into the woods on the Santee, 40-something miles from Charleston. And those French, some of them had softer hands than I got. I've been a shopkeeper all my life. And they were out in the wilderness chopping trees down to make them a shelter out of them. Their first nights were spent underneath sails they had stolen from the uh, little sailboats down at the wharfs and all. And they strung them between trees and the men slept under them. The ladies didn't go with them, the children didn't go with them. They stayed in Charleston for a while. And these guys almost starved to death. And the Native Americans came and rather than wiping them out like they feared, they came to their aid, they taught them how to fish and to hunt and gather different foods from the wilderness, to plant corn and potatoes. Uh, it was quite a while, it's said that it was a good six, eight months before they had their first loaf of bread. So they almost died out there. The wives and kids finally came in, they had little shelters to live in, very similar to the Native Americans' huts. And they went about the business of building better homes, not plantations you think of now. They didn't build Hampton Plantation at that time. It was a roof to keep the, the rain off and the cold out. <coughs> and a man got on one end of a whipsaw and his wife was on the other, or the biggest son, and they made themselves a home. Now, when you go to Charleston and you see all their names on the grand homes that came in several generations later, that they've got the Prelos and the Gilliards and the Ravenels and the Porches, all of those names were on the Santee. That's from later generations when those French succeeded, when they planted and worked hard. And they didn't sit on a horse and watch their homes being built. They built their homes. And then, sadly, through enslaved people, they prospered. They brought in African Americans to plant crops to harvest trees and they made themselves into wealthy people. The first product to come out of their area was a pine tree or an oak tree. When you cut down a bunch of trees, what do you do with it? There's money laying on the ground. So those logs were processed and sold. The tar and the turpentine that comes from the sap from the longleaf pine was processed. John Palmer, who settled in that area and had Mount Moriah Plantation, uh, became Turpentine John. He was the king of the turpentiners. That turpentine and tar was used in the shipbuilding industry. It made some men very wealthy. A lot of them up in Horry County made their wealth that way as well. Um, over time, those French were accepted in Charleston and started building homes there and marrying some English girls. And boys from Charleston were marrying French girls. French girls are notoriously pretty. I never met one. I keep looking for them. But they say they are. And so a lot of intermarriage went on, mainly over that little girl might have been an ugly little French girl, but she was wealthy and she had the land next door. And so a lot of marriages uh, were put together by two daddies sitting around thinking about how do we expand our wealth. And that went on a lot. But the French survived and prospered on the Santee. Some came down the river towards the mouth a little bit. Some English came and settled at the mouth of the Santee, names like uh, Rutledge and Middletons and uh, a lot of Charleston names, Lynches. Uh, we had one Irishman, McGregor, that came in and settled. 
and they prospered as well. At one time there was a hundred English families and sixty, excuse me, I got it backwards, sixty English and a hundred French living there together and getting along pretty good. One thing they did for us, they established a church at, at uh, Jamestown. It was a French Huguenot church. Over some time, England takes over the territory, it's Carolina, and these folks give way to the Anglican church. And they petition to be a parish of their own and to have a church there. And so they abandoned the Huguenot church at that location and started an Anglican church. They built a series of them, Jamestown, down the river a little bit at Echaw Creek, they had two churches. Then they came down later as the population shifted more and built one at Wombaw Creek, a branch of the Santee. I live right next door to it today. Me and my dog, babe, one or the other, will greet you every time you come to visit. In there a Godine Chapel. What's that? Gordine. Gordine's Chapel is not our chapel. Okay. Our chapel. That's Gordine. my name. Well, Gordine's are a little farther up there. They y'all are up around uh, Strawberry mainly, and that's that's Gordine's Chapel. And it's a wonderful place. They do one horrible thing to it. They lock it up. You got to be there when they're showing it off. We keep ours open because we feel it's safer if you guys can come and visit, and the bad guys don't know you're on the way. In fact. One case of some people stealing a few bricks because somebody from Georgetown, I won't say who it is, but I know who he was, <laughs> he put out a $5 bounty on old English brick and some Georgetown boys being enterprising like you know they are. They came with a truck and loaded up some of the bricks from my portico. And they started off taking, get their money from Georgetown and uh, they overcalculated. They put too many bricks in the old truck and it popped a tire. <laughs> but like the South is, a good Samaritan came along to give them a hand. It was a Charleston County policeman. <laughs> and I always tell people, you can mess with a lot of things, but you don't mess with God's house because he'll get it even with you before you get out of sight of the building. Uh, so we got our bricks back and they got what they deserved. It wasn't five dollars either. <laughs> but our church, today we call it Brick Church because it was the first Brick Church to sit on our, in our parish here. And it's wonderful. It's St. James Santee Parish or Brick Church or Wombaugh Church, either one. And it's been the church of a lot of good families uh, of South Carolina. Great men and women have gone to church there over the years. That's where Eliza Lucas Pinckney went to church occasionally. Francis Mary went to church there. George Washington swung by there. And some people say he went to church. I don't think so. Um, or that would be the Washington pew today. <laughs> but anyway, um, lots, of, lots of great people. When I go to church there, which is not very often, to a lot more since I live next door. I sit there and I just wonder, whose place am I sitting in? What great lady of man sat here before me? And I, I, I have to tell you the truth, I, sometimes I kind of slide around like that. You reckon know? <laughs> old Francis sat here? <laughs> He's my hero. He's a great guy. Well, let me tell you a little bit of our Revolutionary War period. I'm not going to go into great detail, but Francis Marion, who's my hero, he's the guy that got me into history. He, I watched him on TV as a boy, I read every book about him. And Francis, of course, you know, he was up closer to Pineville than McClellanville. But he, when he got his men together, he had a great reach. People from Williamsburg County made up most of his men. Uh, but all the way down to the coast where McClellan Mill would, would be, he fought. He had headquarters at Hampton Plantation. 
He was almost captured at Hampton one time. He slipped out the back door and swam across the creek to safety. He escaped so quickly that he pulled the arm off the chair he was sitting on, and for years they had that restored chair sitting there. I wish it was there today, but we don't know where it went. But people like Archibald McClellan, one of the founders of McClellanville, fought with them. And uh, Randy and I keep hashing around the idea that one day we're going to find or uh, found an organization called the Order of the Swamp Fox. And if you can prove that your ancestor goes back to one of the men that served with them, you get inducted. You'll be the first one. God bless you, my dear. <laughs> Write me a check for $100. <laughs> well, I'm serious. We, we might do that one day. I, I, he deserves recognition. I, you know, I, I kid about history a lot. I don't know whether you noticed it. But if it wasn't for Francis Marion, we'd be speaking English today. <laughs> he was the only general in the colony at one time in command of anybody. They had all pushed off to North Carolina with Cornwallis and all of them traveling along behind him, chasing him. And he had to hold the state. Now, here's a man that didn't have a regular army. These were farmers that he was in charge of. That, were released to go plant their corn or their cotton or whatever they had to plant and then when he called they came running. Not just a few men, sometimes two, three thousand would drop their plows and take their horse and their rifle and their shot and meet Mary. They would come in twos and threes at a time during the night and the next morning there would be men sleeping on the ground with the horses grazing beside them ready to fight. Now. I was in your U.S. Army, but I wasn't going to fight like that, because you can get killed that way. <laughs> and a lot of them did, sadly. A lot of men died in support of Mr. Marion and for the cause of independence. And lots of them fought because of Marion's big draw over them and their confidence in him. And he was a spindly, little, gnarly dude that would not be called attractive by anyone. He walked with bow legs, a big, long nose, a tiny man. He wasn't what you think of the tall, big, George Washington type general at all. But there was no leader like him in the army except him. When he spoke, they listened, they took his commands, and they fought to the death when told to. Uh, there, was, there was nobody in our history like, like him. And so I uh, give every opportunity to praise him because, hey, once you're a hero of mine, it's for life. Um, I want to tell you one quick story I just heard about Marion's men. It has not one thing to do with my community, but I just discovered that one family, the Brawler family from Marion County, a couple of the boys were called up to serve with Marion and decided they were going off with him. And the daddy heard of it, and he said, nope, if one goes, we all go. So Jacob Brawler and his 22 sons <laughs> went off to a fight with Mary. And he had children by two marriages, the large families with both. Don't say poor woman. <laughs> Sadly, only one child came back. He had been wounded. He was in the newspaper articles, uh, a little bit weak-minded, and uh, lived out his life in Marion. They had one daughter, um, and the wife went to gather up her kids that had been killed and her husband. All of them killed 
somewhere in one of the battles. I can't find out which one. But we all celebrate the Sullivan family of World War II. Boys that died together on a ship, five of them, I think it was. Yeah. And because of them, men can't serve together with their brothers. That's a wise thing. But these boys went off and they all died. And I can't find diddly out about them, but I'm going to because they need plaques and monuments and everything else. For a man to, to so love his country, even before it is one, that he would sacrifice his life and all of his children is amazing to me. And I think it's because of the power and the draw of Francis Mary that he wanted to be there. So anyway, if you can, all you researchers out there, find something out for Jacob Brawler for me and bring it to me. We're going to celebrate it. And if you find out that this is a lie, you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> I want to tell you a little bit about the town of McClellanville. McClellanville didn't even have a name. We were a little settlement on the banks of the Santee River. We were a resort. Can you imagine us being a resort? <laughs> we don't even have a Ferris wheel like Myrtle Beach. <laughs> but there were lots of little resorts that sprung up all throughout what's now the Low Country. There was Pauley's Island, which was a big resort. There was Pineville, Rockville, Plantersville, lots of bills. Somerville, uh, Walterburg didn't get a bill. <laughs> uh, but there were lots of them. wonderful, wonderful places where planters decided to go to rather than packing up and going to Charleston, taking all of your clothes, all of your house servants and everything, and going and staying for months. Somebody came up with the idea, if we had some places close by where we live, near the ocean, or into the pine forest where there's healthier air to breathe, we can go there, and if needed, we can hurry back home. And so coastal places like McClellanville were established. We actually had two settlements that predated McClellanville, one on Cedar Island and one on Murphy Island. This storm came by in 1822 and wiped the settlements out. And so, being smart fellows, our planters decided, uh uh, we're not going back there again. So, they decided to come to McClellanville. The mosquitoes were not as bad as on the Santee River. Now, I live in McClellanville. You can't convince me that the mosquitoes are any worse anywhere else in the world. <laughs> Pierre Manigo says Alaska's got worse mosquitoes. And then he went there and now he says, no, McClellanville has worse mosquitoes. Uh, but they came and a little community started to develop. In 1860, <coughs> there was a grand total of six houses in McClellanville. So we're not a, a real old town when you compare to Georgetown and to Charleston and other settlements like that. But we have a rich history, I think, and good people have come and moved in there. The first six included the postmaster from the Santee, Mr. Baxley, he's a Williamsburg County fellow. We had the Pinkneys that came from Fairfield Plantation and settled there, the Dorr family from up in Georgetown here and at Harrietta Plantation and others, Walnut Grove. Uh, let's see, who else did we have? Oh, this guy named Dr. W.T.W. W. Baker came. He was my great-great-granddaddy. Uh, he was a handsome, good-looking fellow, just like the, all of us his descendants. <laughs> Some of them stuck. <laughs> but, good luck. He came and settled up on the Santee River when no doctor wanted to be there. There was a guy from Charleston and came and kind of interviewed for the position. And he wrote his wife and he used these words. It's too far outside of the world. <laughs> and we ought to put that on the welcome sign. Don't, <laughs> don't move here. It's too far outside of the world. 
but that guy was right. But for some reason, Dr. Baker left Sumter, where he had been temporarily working with a cousin. He was from Buford area. And he comes and settles on a plantation called Egremont. The house burns down, his wife had died, so he moves into McClellanville and builds a small cottage and becomes the town doctor. Um, why, I'll never know. Because there was no chance of him making any real money. Uh, but he survived. I mean, you got paid in chickens and eggs, but he survived. And he was a good man. And he didn't bring me to McClellanville because I'm related to those Huguenots. I go back way past him. But uh, he brought my, my granddaddy to town because he had a son that had a daughter that was a big old girl. And on my daddy's side, there was a big old guy. They called him Big Hill. And her brother worked with Big Hill. He brought Big Hill home to meet his big, big sister. Here I am. <laughs> up somewhere. <laughs> I'm afraid to do the DNA from the ancestors. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not Big Hill's relative. <laughs> but McClellanville did, after their six homes, we got stores. Our first store was started by a veteran of the Civil War. He was a German boy that came into Charleston and immediately had to make the biggest decision of his life. This war has started. What side do I take? And he stood with the Confederates, like a lot of young men did. And they formed a German artillery group and eventually found their way to the Santee River and they went to Blake's Plantation and established a little camp there. It's called Camp Palmer. And there they built a little small earthen fortification to protect a railroad trestle that was farther up the Santee River near Jamestown. There's still a railroad trestle there. I was two days ago, I took a picture underneath it. But anyway, it's there. And they settled in at Palmer and then went on up the river to Battery Warren, it's called today. Uh, Reverend Warren had a plantation there and they built a fort on that property. And the idea was to protect that railroad trestle. There was a series of S curves there. And if a gunboat were to come up the river, they would have to negotiate those curves. And a couple of times in that travel, that bow was going to be forced, uh, facing the cannons of Battery Warren. And when you're facing the cannons, you can't fire back because the cannons go this way. And so it was a brilliant idea. But the smarter idea was the little two cannon fort down there where they first settled at, at uh, Camp Palmer, because that's where the skirmishes took place. Not one cannon was ever fired at Battery Warren at an enemy. Lots of targets on the other side on parade days, on Sundays when not everybody got in their buggy and went up there and watched the cannons. Well, when they actually sent some gunboats up, they had to negotiate some S curves near Blake's. And that's when they had a, a little skirmish lobbing a few shells at one another. And during that one, one occasion, the Federals actually won. They didn't take any land or anything like that or hold anything, but they won. And as they often do, they give some of the slaves of the area a chance to go with them, to lead, to make their escape from slavery. And some of the people from Blake's plantation got on board and came up here to Georgetown to safety. And along the way, some of the young men were given a proposition. You can enlist and go off with us and fight. And some of them did. And one of them, his name was Robert Blake. He enlisted. And they gave him a job on a gunboat. And he went to the Battle of Secessionville and lobbed cannonballs in. 
The young man had the job of firing the cannon. Blake's job was to bring him shot and powder, <coughs> lugging these heavy cannonballs to him and passing them to him. The guy firing the cannon was shot and killed. And Blake took over and did what he didn't have to do. He kept firing and firing and firing. Mr. Blake is the first African American to receive a Medal of Honor. Now there's another gentleman who was nominated before him. Blake was set. But Blake is the first man to receive it in hand. And one of these days, Randy, I'm going to inspire you to put up a uh, historic marker in Mr. Blake's honor at Battery Warren because the people of our area, Vinny grew up in the area of South Santee, the young people that lived there, the little black kids that lived there, need to know that there was a man in their midst that was brave and did what was honorable. Now, some of my friends say, you know he was on the wrong side of the war. <laughs> well, today we're still Americans. We were Americans then fighting one another, and we're Americans fighting one another now in different ways. Uh, but Mr. Blake did what was necessary of him, and I'm proud of him, and one day we're going to recognize him. Everybody don't know his name. Y'all, McClellanville didn't have a name. You know how we got our name? We had some Confederates that served on the other side of the creek. Today it's a little subdivision being built. Well, not just, it's not fancy enough to be a proper subdivision. It's just like a bunch of houses on the other side of the creek. But at one time it was just a couple of farms over there. Uh, and they sent 500 boys over there, and for what reason, I have no clue why you stationed 500 guys in McClellanville. There wasn't anything for 500 guys to do. <laughs> we sat around a lot in my army. But anyway, they were shipping some cotton out of there. Cotton was currency at one time. You could pay for things with bales of cotton. Charleston was being blockaded, Georgetown monitored, almost blockaded. And so you couldn't get things in and out of the big port. So we got little gunboats, little small boats, and loaded them with cotton and would bypass the blockades. And we were successful until the little Ada came to pick up their shipment. And they loaded them, and the Union had heard about it. And they came in with gunboats and, and were determined to take it and did. Well, our guys heard that the Union was coming and they came and they, we fired a few shots back and forth, a couple of cannonballs lobbed here and there, and guess what business we got out of? We got out of the cotton shipping business. But our boys are not to be deterred on making a dollar. <laughs> and we went into a better business, a much safer business. We went into salt manufacturing. And today we actually make salt in McClellanville today. We've got a young lady that's got her own salt works, Cape Coral Maine Salt Company. But salt was in great demand. And you could make a lot of money off of salt. Every soldier had to have salted food to march. You couldn't go off into the woods to a battle without salted food. Uh, everybody in the home front needed salt. Our salt at that time was coming from England. Well, you couldn't get English salt into Charleston, into Georgetown, and then blockade it. So where do you get the salt from? You get it from McClellanville. You get it from Myrtle's Inlet. You get it from Beaufort. You get it from Wilmington. Lots of little coastal communities went into salt manufacturing. Salt works. If you look at a lot of the skirmishes and battles along Florida and Pauley's Island had a skirmish where they went in to knock out the salt work. Nobody knows the salt story today, but it's, it was a big part of our history. We sold salt for five dollars a barrel and shipped it all over the place. One boy, uh, Mr. Barr, 
uh, was stationed at Battery One, and he kept writing letters on to his wife, Rebecca, send the wagon. There's money to be made. We can get salt for five dollars a barrel. We can sell it for fifteen. Rebecca never sent a wagon, but he never <coughs> insisted. Sadly, he was shipped off and killed in a battle shortly after that. He never made it home. Uh, but it, that's a real sad story too. But we won't tell any more sad stories. But McClellanville got the uh, name finally from those five hundred boys on the other side of the creek. They wanted to get letters from home. Every boy does. I stood in line waiting for my name to be called many a time and to be disappointed. My mother liked the phone, the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't issue phones back then. But anyhow, they decided we needed a name. What do you call your place? Well, different names were batted around. It was going to be called Jerryville after the creek. It was going to be Esterville. All kinds of names were uh, considered. And finally, they made a decision for us. They started getting their mail address to McClellanville. Now, McClellanville was founded by two men, a Mr. McClellan and Mr. Marson. Archibald McClellan, Archibald James McClellan, and Richard Tilly of Morrison on two plantations side by side. Over here, McClellan had Point Plantation. Over here, uh, Morrison had a, a property called the Jeremy Track. He owned Laurel Hill, Buck Hall, Doe Hall outside of town, what would become the town. But he had this property button up against Mr. McClellan, and they sold <coughs> lots on either side, and it became a town. Well, when McClellanville was decided on, that didn't make the McClellan on the Morrison very happy. You know, they've been there. They helped to start it. But listen, McClellans have been there long before Miss Morrison came around. Uh, they had settled in there way before the town was even thought of. And they came out of Williamsburg County. Archibald McClellan came and settled there with a, a congregation, uh, I forget, Reverend Witherspoon was his name, and they settled up there. He settled somewhere between uh, King Street and Indian Town, closer to Indian Town, I understand. He was a carpenter. He helped to build the first church in King Street, and he must have prospered up there. We don't know much about what he did and what he owned, but he did pretty good. He came and bought a couple of plantations in St. James Santee Parish, and one of them was the Point Plantation. Now, it wasn't a great plantation because it wasn't on the Santee River. He faced the Atlantic Ocean. If you have salt water, you can't plant rice. But he could raise cattle, he could produce salt, uh, he could grow other things. And he did. They, they prospered, but were not one of the great, giant, wealthy families. <coughs> Mr. Morrison, oh, hang your head. Mr. Morrison was a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Morrison was from Pennsylvania. Yes! <laughs> His family settled up in York County, Pennsylvania. Not bad. Lancaster. <laughs> not Lancaster. Right. Lancaster, Lancaster, I've been told. And they, they did all right up there. His dad died, his mother was ill, and an uncle was coming south. And he took this teenage boy and brought him south. His uncle's name was James Brown. He didn't have the famous, you know, famous flames. He was another. <laughs> and he came and settled in Christ Church Parish. He prospered. The boy grew. He worked at Bulls Island on a plantation. And apparently, he came together with some money and his uncle's wealth. And he came up and bought Laurel Hill Plantation just south of McClellanville. He prospers and ends up with about 7,000 acres of land in our area. <coughs> Doe Hall, Buck Hall, all of these places. And is one of the founders. And I think, I deny it, but I think I have some arson blood in me. 
I've tried to get the Yankee blood out of me, but they won't give me a transfusion for that reason. <laughs> I tell people, like I told my friends that I know are from Pennsylvania, a lot of Scott Irish settled in Pennsylvania. A lot of Scott Irish from Pennsylvania settled in South Carolina. That's the reason we've got Lancaster, York, Chester. From Columbia to North Carolina were settled by Pennsylvanians and Virginians. They came down the old wagon road when there was nothing up there. They got a hundred acres for the head right, fifty for the wife, and fifty for all the children, and settled in real wilderness that wasn't hot, it wasn't uh, rice country. And like those French. They went into the woods and with their own hands built their fortunes and settled up there. And so them Yankees did good, <laughs> real good. And uh, during the revolution, it was them that won our independence as well as those boys from King Street. Uh, they did not like the English. They weren't treated well over there, and they came here to get away from uh, bad treatment. And so they were pretty tough fighters. And so we owe a, a great deal to Pennsylvania. Now, if any of you raise your hand from Ohio, <laughs> I don't mind you living here. <laughs> You've got family. Don't tell them where you are. <laughs> Everywhere I look, I see y'all. <laughs> we got to stop this. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're going to bring your cousins from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's going to be the second revolution. <laughs> We're going to fight you to the death. <laughs> y'all, I could talk to y'all about my place forevermore. I love it. I love our history. I make a lot of fun of it because you got to have some enjoyment in history. It can't be just cutting dry stuff because it was made up of human beings. All our history is other than natural history. So it's about people and people <coughs> have funny sides and anguish and toil and trouble and death. And I try to not dwell on the ugly and the hard side, but to talk about their accomplishments and what they did with a sense of humor, because you had to have a sense of humor to go out into the, the woods and say, this is my home and I'm going to take it. Uh, if you were just some old prune, you'd give up on it in the first year. You had to have a sense of humor to face what they faced. And uh, pioneers, they were. There is not one person that ever got on a Conestoga wagon and headed west that was any more a pioneer than a Huguenot or an Englishman or a Scot Irish or African American. Our African Americans were brought here but they had a harder road to travel when they became free. You talk about having nothing, not a piece of land to stand on, not a horse to ride, not a dime in your pocket. When freedom came to the African Americans, many stayed in place because they had no place to go, nowhere to go with, and they stayed. Now. I often say some stayed because they couldn't go, some stayed because they had to stay, because they had family to feed, and some stayed because it was home. If you're the third or fourth generation African American, y'all, I don't care where you live. I grew up in North Charleston. They don't even have the greatest reputation in the world as a place to live. And I hung my head about it for years but it was home to me, and good people were there, and I knew the people there. And an African-American who is freed 
has the same tug at their heart about the place that they were children in and their grandparents lived. And so I think home had a great tie and pull on them. If you go on the outskirts of McClellanville today, there's a lots of black families there. Benny has researched hundreds of them. And they are there because the land that they sleep on every night was given in, to them by Mr. Morris and Mr. McClellan because they were afraid to lose their workforce. They were going to go away and they had nobody to work their, their plantations to bring their crop in. They were going to lose that land to the, to the tax man anyway. So they divvied it up. And if you look at the tax map of Charleston County, there's more little slivers of land outside McClellanville where the black families live. They're little slivers because they got a nice little chunk originally. Then over the generations, Daddy and Mama gave off a sliver to this son when he got married, to this daughter when she got married. And they're just little slivers of land. And there's not many blacks that live in McClellanville, a handful. Uh, most of the blacks live outside. And it's because two white men owned McClellanville. White people <coughs> settled it. The blacks who were freed settled on the white man's land on the outside of the village. That's where the land was. And so we're not separated because we don't like each other. I love Benny. I'd marry you if she wasn't so contrary. <laughs> back to Hampton Plantation. Uh, her family was a slave there, and she's an expert on the history of that place and our, our region. And we have a good many of the blacks are now reaching to our little museum, and I'm so proud of it. I had a couple in day before yesterday. They came in, and they were searching their roots. They want to know who they are and who their people were. And it's not easy for them to get that information because of slavery and papers lost and all of that. So I'm very happy when I can uh, make a man cry like I did on the teacher. So that's our story, and I appreciate all of you coming, and I have to tell you, I'm pretty proud of you. I have not seen one of you not off yet. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Some some questions, if you might want to ask. Just tell everybody what the hours of your museum when it's open, please. Um, it's open on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 10 to 1-ish. No, 10 to 12-ish. 1-ish to 5-ish. Most of the time-ish. Sometimes we close because somebody's been buried that day, married that day, or oh, either Randy and I don't like to work. <laughs> but most of the time, we're there, and on days that we're closed, often we're there. My little yellow Volkswagen is there, just knock real loud on the door. I'm deaf as a post. I mean, you've got to knock loud, or a lot of people just get the phone number off the sign and call me and say, we're downstairs. <laughs> but I'm happy to open up if you show up. But I just want to give a secret out of it. If you're not there, you're at Grand Round Table. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Benny. <laughs> yes, I can be found in McClellanville. Ask the UPS man where I am. Somebody working in the yard, but they can find me. And, you know, if I just don't have something. In a, the couple that was in the museum the other day when it was closed, uh, they came to Brick Church looking for the family. It was a black couple. And I said, I hate to tell you this, there's no blacks buried here. Who are you looking for? And we got a conversation going. And I said, well, I've got a binder that big at the museum, and it's on your family. You're related to Julius Brown, the great black builder of McClellanville, and to Paul Drayton, the man that preceded him in building churches and houses. And I said, you want to go see the book? And he said, well, you're not open today. And I said, I have a key. We can open up the <laughs> <laughs> And they said, well, do you do that? And I said, of course I will. Y'all, I wish we could be open five days a week like, you know, big 
big town museums, but we're a tiny town with a lot of people volunteering and a lot of organizations. <coughs> Our board sits on other boards and volunteers at other places and teaches in our schools. And so I'm lucky I got Randy. You look at that man, he looks reasonably intelligent. <laughs> but he took the job in the museum as the new director, taking my place. Finally, I can get a little breather and come and go as I want. Uh, I don't get to come and go as much as I want. And they gave me this lovely title, y'all. I am the Director Emeritus. And they gave the title of Director Emeritus to a man who don't know what the hell Emeritus is. <laughs> I still haven't looked it up after the year, so I'm afraid. I do know that it means you work just as many hours and you don't get paid much. <laughs> so Emeritus, I might leave it off my title from now on. But Randy has taken over two years ago, and we're, we're, uh, I'm 75, and I'm too old for computers. I, I mess with them, but I don't know a lot about them. But Randy's pretty good at it, and he's bringing us into the digital world. We recently received a couple of grants from some nice people, and we're going to be digitizing all of our photo collection. We've got over... Uh, probably about 3,800 photos that we've collected. Mm -hmm. Some of them are duplicated on the uh, site here that a sweet friend there put online for all y'all to see. But others we have gathered and they'll be all digitized beautifully and put online one day mm -hmm. for you to look through your ancestors and say, look, there's Aunt Tilly. And all the plats that we've got, we've got huge plat collections. Henry Kuma Morrison did plats of little properties and plantations and did it on the back of the stationery and, and I think it's some of that material that came in, you know that cardboard that was in the shirt when you bought a new shirt? Yeah. That's why I think he did some of his plats on that. <laughs> that was for those poor people that couldn't afford a big fancy plat. But we've got his collection, about 350 plats. We're going to scan all of those and journals and all of those things. We're going to be modern, big time. We're still going to collect, but we're going to be able to get it out to your home. You'll be able to sit in your living room in Ohio. And look at what we have. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any information on the Blaine family? What's the name? Blaine, B-E-L-I-N. Uh, I don't have very much on them, and uh, it's, a, it's an old family of the area. You have ministers and all kind of good folks in the family. I don't have, because they weren't that big in my little mm -hmm. parish. And we, we're a tiny museum, so we can't try to cover the history of the whole world. So we try to concentrate on those people that settled and where they come from, not on the history of South Carolina. Uh, I wish I could, and, but we, you know, we're not an island. We're a little village, we're not an island. And people came from Marion County and Williamsburg County and all of these places, Beaufort County, and came to McClellanville. So we go from the people that decided to live in McClellanville back to their families in all directions. And so there might be a mention of your family in the line somewhere, but a great history I don't have. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Would you tell my favorite story of the crooked streets in McClellanville? Is the plan for planning of the truth. Oh. <laughs> well, one of the great ladies that has lived in McClellanville that nobody outside McClellanville knows by name is a, a lady named May Brailsford. May was a strong will woman, if there ever was one. And if Miss May said you're going to do so and so, you better get busy doing it because you're going to do it. And Miss May decided that our town was growing and 
what was once old farm fields was becoming home sites. The town was growing. This is back in 1935. And she saw these streets being cut through old farm fields, curvy roads, some of them straight, but most of them nice curves that were the way in and out by buggies years before. But there were no trees. They were farm fields. And she says, our town is ugly. And Miss May was right. There was some nice, beautiful oak trees. We got one in town that's a thousand years old. Certified. I think it's older than that. I think they cheated us. But anyway, <laughs> there's wonderful oak trees and pine trees and trees of every type there. But she said, we got to do something about it. And Miss May went to the school and shut it down and gathered up young boys, teenagers, and a few teenage girls, and they went into the woods and they dug up oak trees and they carted them into town. One palmetto, I don't know why only one, but one palmetto <laughs> came. And she went and she said, put me one here. 40 feet down the road, she said, put me one here. Put me one here, and they planted them. And we've got a tree committee now that's planted about 100 or so over the last 10, 15 years. And they come and they put this gator bag around it so water can drip down and everything, and they prune and fuss over. Ms. May said, put me one here, put me one there, and God rained on them. And that's the only care they ever got under her. <laughs> but they survived. You ride down our streets, and Ms. May's street uh, tree is still here, and 40 feet down there, there's Ms. May's tree, and everything. And you can tell, all of hers are about the same size. God's are a little bit bigger. Um, but they're there, and we are called Tree City USA, and for the last 20 years we've been Tree City USA. I'm sure there's more Tree City USA's name, but we have been designated that for a long time. And it's because of this honorary old woman that <laughs> saw that there was something to be done for a town and she could do it. And our little girls, I tell them the story of Miss May intentionally because I say, look what one woman could do then. This lady saw something that was needed. She did it. She was strong. There's a lesson to be learned. Whatever you want to do, you can do too. Just do it. And heck with those men. <laughs> <laughs> and I also tell those same little girls about Eliza Lucas Pinkney. Oh, yeah. Eliza Lucas was 16 years old and changed the fortune of every man, woman, and child in the state of South Carolina and a lot of people around the world. She was an exceptional young lady. She was educated like a boy of that time. Her favorite subject was botany, and she proved it. Her daddy sent her trees and plants and fruits to plant to see if they would grow and become a cash crop for South Carolina. And she discovered indigo would do well here. After she married Charles Pinckney, the two of them distributed the seeds. Daddy sent some guys here to show her how to process it, and she changed everybody's fortunes. And you know what she could have done? She could have planted indigo and selfishly started that way. But she shared. And everybody got on board, and it was America's first big cash crop. Oh, one little girl. And I tell ladies today, for years and years and generations and generations, y'all been fighting to get a leg up in our society. This little girl fought when you weren't even supposed to have a leg up. You were supposed to be sitting around and knitting and crocheting and, and learning French and Latin. But you weren't supposed to be farming. You weren't supposed to be running two plantations. And you weren't supposed to be changing the world. And she did. And, of course, we're very proud that her daughter was the mistress of Hampton Plantation on the South Santee. And, of course, great influence in Georgetown area. Indigo Society carries her name uh, or her product. Uh, I was invited to 
give a presentation there years ago, myself and Joe Shaw, showed them how to dye in the process indigo. And I talked about Eliza. And after it was over, these old men, there's no young men. <laughs> they came and they said, I've been a member of this organization all my life. My daddy was a member. His daddy was a member. That's the first time I've ever seen indigo. <laughs> and it floored me. I said, how can you be the oldest organization in the state of South Carolina that carries the name indigo and never seen it? Well, they've seen it now because we gave every man in that room a handkerchief died with yeah. Eliza Lucius <laughs> indigo before we left. And a lot of guys come up to me and say, I still have my handkerchief. <laughs> but y'all, she was exceptional. And she's to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One more. We'll just do one more thing. Okay. And thank you, Bob, for another great program. And uh, Bud, you, you're like a walk-in museum. <laughs> <laughs> As the tallest. I don't have much of a life. <laughs> Thank, thanks for sharing what little life you have with me. Indeed, my honor. <laughs> um, the question, you, you did a great job with the, the history in such a compressed time frame, but those wonderful stories, and you got so many more to share about McClellanville. But would you say a little about the future? You talked all about the past of McClellanville. What do you think is coming in the future? Of your, um, your little the future is something that we're very worried about. Um, we in McClellanville don't worry real hard. <laughs> we don't like to worry a lot. But we look down the road and we see our sister community, Mount Pleasant, who used to be McClellanville once. When I was a boy, the only reason you went to McClellanville was to get to the beach. You didn't even stop there unless you had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and you would drive through and go to Sullivan's Island, Isle of Palms, and go to the beach. There was a couple of little restaurants on the main highway. The little village, like our little village, was there. And then all of a sudden, they started building plants out in North Charleston, in Goose Creek. And nobody wanted to live in North Charleston. It was a rough neighborhood. I didn't think so, unless I was in a fight. But anyway, <laughs> they didn't want to live there. The, the plant executives wanted something nicer. And they saw this little community on the other side of the Cooper River Bridge that they could afford to buy a house. A nice home could be built there. They could jump over the bridge to go to Charleston without having to buy one of the expensive homes. And so they did, and settlements came up, Snee Farms and others were built, and it slowly grew. And now, look at it, it's just gigantic hodgepodge of stuff, and it's still growing. Our little community near us, Ollendorf, is embracing that idea and saying, come, here we are, build your subdivisions. They've got several on the drawing board, one on the way right now. And they're saying, come. Well, we're right down the road. Well, over the years, some of our wise men and ladies have started trying to take some of the land away from the developers and putting in conservation easements, adding land to the uh, national forest that surrounds us. We have the Francis Marion on one side, we have the Cape Horn Maine Wildlife Refuge, best of both worlds, all surrounding us. And that's our buffer. There are pockets of land that a developer, a developer could come and build a subdivision on, but there ain't no running water yet. So he's not coming. You know what comes down that pipe when they install it? Rats and developers. <laughs> we'll take the rats. We can handle the rats. <laughs> but we don't want to be anything other than a village. Now, if you decide you want to come, even if you're from Ohio, <laughs> and you want to move to McClellan, then we're happy to have you, honestly. Uh, we want people to live. Randy's in, 
he's a realtor. He's got to make a living. And we've got carpenters. Must make a living. And we need new people. You can't marry your cousin all the time. None of us have tried. So we've got to have fresh blood and fresh ideas and energy. And we're getting that. We're getting young people that are coming to move, and they're tired. <coughs> they're coming, and they're buying and bringing their children. They're filling our schools and our churches and our organization and bringing new life to the town. But we don't want 25, 30, 250, 500 of you at one time. We can't handle it. We, we don't have dump trucks and, and garbage trucks and all of those things. Uh, we got a guy in a pickup truck that picks up the trash. We got a lady that's our dog catcher. She don't catch them, she just takes care of them and finds them a home. Uh, we're a village and that's what we want to stay. And maintaining the village atmosphere and feel is very important and how we're going to do it we're struggling with. Um, we don't want to be known as the unfriendly town that says stay in Ohio don't come. Um, but if that's what it takes we'll do it. <laughs> um, we have this wonderful thing in our favor and I say it lightheartedly but it's true most of us are related to those Huguenots and those Scott Irish. We can run you out of town in a flash. <laughs> we can be the most honoriest people you ever met in your life. We decide we don't like you. You're gone. And it happens. And people come and know for a little while because we're this pretty little village. Aren't y'all pretty? We hear that. Y'all so quaint. I love the word quaint. Well, after a while, they decide, oh, they ain't quite, those people are vicious. <laughs> <laughs> and they move, and Randy gets to sell another house. <laughs> but we're going to figure it out. Uh, we, we're pretty resilient people. Hey, Brian, and we'll grow. Do you mind mentioning that we do have some of our publications here? Yes, yeah. Oh yeah. To look at if you're Randy yeah. Zappella. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. Y'all, we produce some books in house that are about the history of our area. A lot of it overlaps with Georgetown, of course, because a lot of our folks came from Georgetown. Uh, we've had great relationships with this town. A lot of our folks worked in that old steel mill and the old um, paper, paper mill. Sorry decades and generations. We've had a great, great relationship. You know when you're a little village in the middle of nowhere? In the old days, where'd you shop? Georgetown, Charleston. We had freight boats running back and forth bringing things to one another. We build a freight boat to hook us up with Georgetown. Georgetown would build a freight boat to come get business from McClellanville. And after a while, we quit building freight boats because we knew they would. <laughs> How's the shrimp We might marry our cousins, but we need not <laughs> How's the shrimp industry? The shrimp industry is another doubtful situation. We're healthy uh, in the fact that those people that are in the business are making a living some of them boys have got some big old pickup trucks and long old boats they drag through town and they got two, three kids and a wife that works at the bank. That's the insurance plan. She wasn't working at the bank, he wouldn't have no boat. But <laughs> our shrimp industry has gone down considerably in numbers of shrimpers and numbers of boats. It's happening throughout the whole of the shrimping industry in the south. Young people don't want to be shrimpers anymore. When they are just barely out of elementary school or maybe before that, mom and daddy has already picked out what college they're going to. They're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an Indian chief or something. Uh, a shrimper is not high on their radar. And the old days, a boy would look at his daddy going off to be a shrimper and say, one day I'm going to be a shrimper. He'd start wearing white boots immediately almost. 
And that's not happening. There's a few young men in our business. Most are old, and the boats are older. This had not been a shrimp boat built in years. They just patch up the old ones. They put fiberglass on them, um, and they keep them afloat. Every year we lose one or two of them. And eventually, if we don't be a little imaginative and recreate ourselves, we're going to lose to industry. In McClellanville, we've got two shrimp houses now. One is owned by my cousin, the mayor, and he wants to retire. We won't let him. <laughs> because what happens when he does? Who gets the business? What happens to it? So we're trying to come up with a plan now that will um, be a solution to his problem and to our problem. But we are competing against imported shrimp. We sell shrimp that's never, ever been to Thailand. <laughs> never. And you know what? It's the difference between the shrimp from Thailand and China and Argentina and wherever, ours looks like shrimp. It tastes like a shrimp. I went to Camden one day and had lunch, and they brought me some shrimp and grits, and I sent it back. I apologize. I said, I should have known better. It didn't look like shrimp. You could see through it. It was translucent, kind of grayish, clear, and it didn't have the little pink stripes. Now, where he was born, I don't know. It wasn't in Bulls Bay. It wasn't up here off of Georgetown. It didn't taste like shrimp. And we have got to let the world know that our shrimp is the best. You can't sell a Cadillac at a Ford price. Now, we're selling our shrimp at the same price as the imported stuff because we're scared to death that they're going to run us out and nobody will buy our shrimp. We have got to find some leader that uh, is brave enough to say, if you want our shrimp, you're going to have to pay a little bit more because we're the only ones that have it. And we haven't found anybody that will stand up and say, hey, look at us. You're paying big bucks for an apple wrapped in tissue paper along with a dozen more because they're premium apples or something that's great about that apple. Our shrimp is one of a kind too. We're going to start having to charge more. And we're going to have to buck up because our friends, the restaurateurs, are going to have to pay a little bit more for our shrimp. So we've got to create a demand for it, the knowledge of how good it is, and we've got to be willing to stand up for it because they're going to run us out of business. Slap out of business. We can't supply the shrimp for America anymore. That, happened, that went away when I was a boy. There's not too many restaurants left on the South Carolina coast that sell South Carolina shrimp. The ones that do, I'm very proud of because, uh, one, they care about the product they sell. And two, I think they really care about the people that bring it in. Uh, but we've got a lot of thinking about it. And we're going to need a lot of folks that don't shrimp to help because they need support. And when you go to that restaurant and you sit down and you see some funny looking thing that's supposed to be a shrimp, <clears throat> you need to call them out on it and say, uh-huh, I don't know where your shrimp comes from, but I'm an American. I want my shrimp. And send it back to them. Yeah. Right, I'm going to tell you what I tell most people. I know y'all got to have something better to do than to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Retirement can't be that bad for most of you. <laughs>